Coming up on Doctype, we hack our way around Ajax's same domain policy and call third-party web services with JSONP. Then, learn how to clean up your CSS and select like you've never selected before with CSS selectors. So get that cat down from the cactus because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is made possible by Squarespace and Barcamp Orlando. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that wants to learn a little bit of coding or a developer that thinks everything they make looks like crap, Doctype is here to show you the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help you take your next project to the next level. Okay, so the big news this week is the IE9 Platform Preview 1 yes. release. Platform Preview. Platform Preview. Is what it's called. Platform so it's not even like a real browser, it's just like a fake browser? I, like, I, I guess. I haven't yeah. had a chance to use it because I don't have a good enough Windows, apparently. Yeah, apparently it only supports <laughs> Windows Vista Service Pack 2 and Windows 7. I only have XP yes, right rendering now. Rendering web so. pages is serious business. Yeah. XP can't handle that. Yes, yeah, so you definitely have to have Vista Service Pack 2. Anyway, they have some CSS3, I mean, border radius, so that's pretty yeah, much it. Yeah, they have a little bit of CSS3 and HTML5 support. They have uh, border radius, I think some of the new color stuff, and some of the new selectors. And that's good, it's improvement. I'll give them yeah, that. They yeah. showed off, um, it's not in the platform preview, but they showed off their uh, HTML5 video support. So that's going to be cool seeing that come come up. Hopefully we can start getting the HTML5 video bus rolling. But it looks like they are going for H.264, so that's kind of just another... Yeah, so I mean the Theora versus H.264 war rages on, so we'll see how that goes. But maybe we'll talk about that a little more in another episode. This episode, we are going to talk about talk about talk about how to use remote web services using J using JSON P. I can't talk today. JSON P. JSON P. <laughs> and CSS selectors. Let's get into it. In episode 12, we took a look at Ajax, which is a great way of loading data into your page without reloading it. Now, it's awesome, but it has this one limitation: you can only load data from your own server. This is because of Ajax's same domain policy, which we explained in episode three. Today we're gonna to look at a technique called JSONP that allows us to load data from third-party web services. JSONP stands for JSON with padding. JSON, or JavaScript Object Notation, is a data format that's used in many web services because it's a subset of the JavaScript syntax, which can be easily evaluated inside of JavaScript. We'll get to the padding part in a moment. Since you can't use XML HTTP request to request a resource from a different domain, JSONP utilizes the script tag, which can load JavaScript from any server. We use JavaScript to create a script tag, with the source being the URL of the service we want. The browser can then fetch and execute it. Now, if the web service had just returned the JSON data, that wouldn't do us very much good. It would just silently evaluate the data, and it wouldn't even alert us that anything has come in, and it wouldn't store it into a variable, so we wouldn't actually be able to access it at all. That's where the padding comes in. So what we can do is create a function to handle the results. This function must be named and visible from the global scope in order for this to work. Then we create a script element with JavaScript and set its source to the service URL. Inside the URL for the service, we tell it the name of our callback. We then append the script into the page and the browser will send the request. The resulting JavaScript should call our callback function with the data as the parameter. Now, if you want to create a web service that supports JSONP, it's pretty simple. You just want to check for a callback parameter, and if it exists, wrap that name plus parentheses around your normal JSON data. If there is no callback parameter, just return your normal JSON response. Remember, because JSONP uses the script tag, you're limited to only GET requests. And since it circumvents the same domain policy of AJAX, the user's cookies will be sent along with the script request. So if you're creating a JSONP web service, be aware that you'll be vulnerable to cross-site request forgery attacks. See episode 13 of Doctype for more information about CSRF attacks. If you're using an AJAX framework, this may be handled for you automatically. For instance, jQuery will switch to JSONP if your URL is on a different domain. Now you will want to read the documentation because you do have to send the callback for this to work. Now when we come back, Nick will be talking about CSS selectors. But first, let's take a second to check out our favorite all-in-one website-in-a-box solution, Squarespace. 
Squarespace is hands down the easiest way to get your site on the web. I mean, how many times has a friend or family member asked you to build them a website? Come on, you're good with computers. Send your friends and family over to Squarespace and let them build the website of their dreams. With Squarespace, anyone can build an awesome website in minutes. They can fully customize every part of the site, edit the CSS, and they can import their existing blog into Squarespace. Squarespace lets you get started with a two-week free trial. You don't even need a credit card. If you want to continue using Squarespace after the trial, do yourself a favor and use the code Doctype and save yourself 10% off the lifetime of your order. Not only are you saving yourself time and money, but you're helping keep Doctype on the air. Check them out at squarespace.com. CSS selectors help you choose which elements on your page you want to apply styling to. We'll take a look at the vast catalog of selectors in CSS. When writing CSS, people tend to stick with the basic selectors, like selecting an element, an ID, or a class. Now, I know CSS selectors might not be as cool as, say, CSS3 box shadows, multi-column layouts, or rounded corners. However, having a solid understanding of CSS selectors will help you write much cleaner CSS and do it a lot faster. There are three types of selectors that I'm going to talk about. First, let's take a look at combinators. Let's start with the Descendant Combinator, which you're probably already familiar with. By putting a space in between two element selectors, you can select any F elements that are descendants of E elements. So for example, using this selector, you could style all the strong tags inside of your paragraph tags. Next is the Child Combinator. This essentially does the same thing as the Descendant Selector, but with a subtle and important difference. Whereas the Descendant Combinator can select any arbitrary descendants of a parent element, the child selector will only select the descendant if it is a direct child of the parent. So for instance, the previous example of styling strong tags would work exactly the same here, but if the strong tag were inside of a link, it would no longer work because the strong tags are not direct children of the paragraphs. Finally, there's the adjacent sibling combinator. This combinator allows you to select elements that immediately follow one another and share the same parent. So for example, if you wanted to indent all the paragraphs that follow a paragraph, you could say P plus P and apply a text indent. It's easy to select elements based on an ID or a class, but in reality, you can select elements based on any other attribute, like the alt attribute for images or the rel attribute for links. Let's take a look. The first one is easy. When you use this selector, you can select any element with an attribute foo. So for example, I could select all the links that have rel attributes. If you want to get more specific, you can use this syntax to access the value of an attribute and select based on that. So for example, I could style all the links that have rel attributes set to the value next. In this case, if the value in quotes is contained anywhere in the attribute, it will be a match. Using this, you could match any title tags that contain a certain word, even if there are other other words separated by whitespace. This is different because in the previous example you had to have an exact match. Pseudo classes are special selectors that allow you to style things on the page that don't necessarily correspond to a real element. Here are just a few. With the first line pseudo class, you can grab the first row of text inside any element. So for example, you could say p colon first line and change the color of the first line of text in a paragraph. The first letter pseudo class is very similar, except instead of grabbing the entire first row of text, it will only grab the first character. This is useful if you want to create a versal, which is an ornamental first letter in a block of text that's typically large in size. The first child selector is a bit different than the previous two. This pseudo class allows you to select the first child element of a parent element E. So for example, if you had a few paragraphs inside a wrapper div and you wanted to change the color of the first paragraph, you could say P colon first child. Now that you've seen the first child selector, you might be wondering, what about the last child selector? I deliberately didn't cover this because it's a selector that's only available in CSS3. In next week's episode, we'll be taking a look at some of the new CSS3 selectors. If you've never been to a Barcamp event, then Barcamp Orlando is a must. It's an all-day event where the attendees are also the presenters. Before the day gets rolling, anyone can post a presentation topic to the big board with a time and place to go see it. Then, you get to pick the presentations that you want to go see. If this is your first Barcamp, we strongly encourage that you present. And you can talk about anything you want, from technology to art or even just washing your cat. Barcamp Orlando starts at 9 a.m. on April 3rd, 2010, here at Wall Street Plaza in downtown Orlando. To learn more, check out barcamporlando.com. 
That's it for this week. Be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype TV on Twitter. And if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. And if you subscribe by RSS or iTunes, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype. So until next Tuesday, remember that every great webpage starts with Doctype. <laughs> <laughs>